My name is uh, Emra Duzel. I'm the moderator of the next session. But uh, before the next session starts, I think we will hear an exciting an announcement. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Milena Damjanova, Director of Science Directorate, Ministry of Education and Science of, of the Republic of Bulgaria. Уважаема комисар Габриел, уважаеми заместник министър Димов, уважаеми дами и господа, за мен е удоволствие да ви съобщя, че на своето съседание на 11 април Министерския съвет на Република България одобри присъединяването advance distinguished uh, commissioner gabriel uh, distinguished professor dimov here it is Gabriel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it was my pleasure to sign this important document according to the decision of the Bulgarian government, which, which was taken just one week ago. And it's, I think it's a great day because uh, our um, uh, commitment to this document, our contribution is extremely important for the scientific community in Bulgaria dealing with personalized medicine. I mean, people from uh, medical universities, people from research organizations will be more active in uh, doing this job, but also it's a contribution to the field of high performance computing. So, thank you. like just to say a few words thank you very much I think that today there is another very important positive signal now we have Bulgaria who has joined us uh, for our common initiative one million human genomes it's a really positive signal for our researchers for us as a Europe so I count on all of you thank you very much Yeah, very exciting development uh, and very fitting to our panel discussion on the future of personalized health and medicine. I would now like the panel members to com come on stage. Please take a seat. So as you just heard from the announcement um, to, to genotype one million uh, genomes uh, in Europe, um, it is clear that medicine and uh, medical research is becoming highly data intensive and that we need new concepts but also new tools to analyze these data to the best benefit of patients. And um, it is also clear that high performance computing has the potential, if we can make good use of these data, to really radically advance personalized health and 
medicine. And I think it is probably fair to say that um, we are now at the verge of a scientific and medical revolution. For the first time, we will be able to integrate continuous data from different medical disciplines, from different organ systems, and from genetics towards a comprehensive, scientific, and clinical understanding of the health trajectory of, individual, of individuals, so that we can make tailored preventive decisions in time. It is clear that this is a really worldwide race for new insights and new information, and this race will be strongly determined by analytical capabilities, but also by technology to actually implement these, just like I think uh, we are seeing uh, in, in attempts to model climate change. But uh, scientific and clinical progress cannot solely depend on data-driven random discovery or serendipity. We need also hypothesis-driven science. And I think it will be a, a challenge uh, to find the right balance between data-driven discovery and hypo hypothesis-driven science. And it is also clear that we have a long way to go to bring the scientific and clinical community um, to a better understanding and better utilization of high performance computing uh, uh, capabilities. Our panel today uh, really brings together, I think, the right expertise to discuss these opportunities and challenges and, um, and that are basically imposed on us by big data and high performance computing. And I'm very grateful that you could all come today. A warm welcome. Um, so we are starting with um, personal statements from each of you. And uh, we will make the beginning with Professor Boyer. Professor Boya is an honorary professor of clinical neurosciences and psychiatry at the University of Paris 7, Denis Diderot, and professor of psychiatry at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He is the current vice president of the European Brain Council and the past president of the European Psychiatric Association, and he explores memory impairment in psychotic patients in during neuroimaging and also connectivity models together with cognitive and navigation procedures. Professor Boyer, um, please tell us, how do you approach high-performance computing and personalized medicine and health? You prepared a slide, which I'm just putting up. It's working? Yeah, fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You precisely mentioned a balanced approach between hypothesis-driven and data-driven uh, research. So I think, uh, and it would be my preliminary statement, uh, that to elucidate the brain mechanism at the origin of mental disorder, which is not exactly the same as uh, elucidating the mechanism of the normal brain, that from an epistemic perspective, a slight, a slight shift. Anyway, uh, to elucidate it, two complementary approaches are necessary. The first one is familiar for researchers working on personalized medicine on HTA. It's summarized on the left column. Um, it consists in collecting all what we know regarding uh, risk factors, protective factors, potential uh, direct or indirect causal factors, etc. Uh, to uh, see how they interplay, uh, what is the status of their connection, uh, how is their hierarchical organization, in order to be able to propose valid biomarkers or at least a biological marker for the endophenotypes. So that's something which is linked to big data, of course. To big data and high performance computing is required once again, it has been uh, discussed this morning, merge with big data. That's the first approach, but a complementary approach, of course, is uh, necessary as well. Um, the second one consists in, or is based in translating uh, uh, at the different model proposed at each level 
uh, of the brain organization on architecture. It's summarized in the right column at each level, which means, so it has been extensively discussed at the beginning of this afternoon, at the molecular level, at the uh, morphological level, neuroatomic, functional, dynamic, network, etc., etc. And translating this model at each level just to test uh, uh, which level could be responsible, or, or which hierarchical organization could be responsible of brain dysfunction. So it's a model-based approach, or hypothesis driven as you want, it's a model-based approach, requiring at the same time high performance computing as well, but more merge, and it is the case for the human brain project, merge with uh, deep learning. So we will have two complementary approaches. The first one linked with big data processing, HPC and big data processing, with a lot of different markers or factors, as you want, which are summarized and very well known, very well known, better known as we think in, uh, uh, for mental disorders, left column. And the other one, which is much more <coughs> model driven, and uh, so once again, <laughs> it has been discussed at the beginning of this afternoon for the human brain project for understanding, which can be the mechanism, the model, the most relevant for explaining the onset of the disorders. But it is complementary, and the only word I would say is complementary, which means that clinical data have to be injected in the model. So left column has to be injected in the right one, and reciprocally, Le right column has to be injected in the left one. Model in clinical data and clinical data in model. Without doing it, it would be extremely difficult <coughs> to propose something which could be relevant or tested at the clinical and human level. And probably in the discussion, uh, we, we, we could give example of the dead end if we, of the dead end we are facing if we are not taking simultaneously these two approaches into consideration. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I look forward to that part of the discussion. Just uh, I have to mention that Professor Boyer has to leave at uh, half past four, so we will try to finish until then. Um, so let's uh, come to the intervention part. Um, Professor Giulia Rossetti uh, has a focus um, um, uh, on high performance computing to characterize biomolecular mechanisms of disease. Uh, she works at the University of Aachen and uh, receives support from the Ulich Supercomputing Center. She combines molecular modeling, simulations, and in silico screening of small molecules with experimental biochemistry. And her goal is really to identify uh, new libraries of candidate uh, uh, molecules uh, to treat diseases. So, uh, Professor Rossetti, what's your take on high-performance computing to find new therapies? Okay, thanks a lot for, for the nice introduction. Yes, I have prepared a slate. Uh, so, uh, the first message that I would like to, to deliver is that uh, drug design is a, a multidisciplinary process, and it can only be successful if you have the integration of different disciplines from uh, medicine, to biology, to chemistry, to computation. And uh, high-performance computing is uh, helping in integrating all this knowledge. And if it is used in the first uh, step of, uh, of drug design, it can strongly reduce the cost of uh, discovering the drugs because it can accelerate the experimental animal test, it can shorten the time to the market, and in general, it can also help in uh, uh, repurposing drugs, so to, to use uh, known drugs for new diseases. But what it is more important, and is the second message I would like to give today, is the fact that um, in the past, uh, high-performance computing was not so relevant in drug design. Uh, but this is not true anymore. So thanks to the in-progress digitalization of medicine, thanks to the enormous advances of data science and the integration of data science approaches to the drug discovery process, now, uh, high-performance computing is not uh, uh, just a uh, support anymore. Now it is uh, like a uh, key enable of uh, realistic modeling and therefore realistic prediction of drug action. And this uh, forces us to completely redefine the uh, traditional drug design approaches toward personalized medicine. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the 
the combination of, of the data-driven and hypothesis-driven personalized medicine and then the, the ability to actually design drugs on that basis is really uh, fascinating. Now, um, uh, of course, what's also very important is that uh, you know, scientists and researchers have access to uh, high-performance computing and um, here uh, I'm happy to introduce um, Professor Yannick Legre, who is the director of the EGI Foundation. Uh, since uh, February 2014, uh, he was formerly a senior research engineer at the French uh, National Science uh, Research Center, Grid and Cloud Institute. And uh, he holds a Master of Science in Information Technology and also a degree in law. Good to have you around. <laughs> and um, Professor Legre has also been a co-founder um, and the president of the International Health Grid Association. Yeah. yeah, please give us your perspective on high-performance computing. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid I'm the ugly duck in, in that panel uh, because e EGI, in fact, is a federated infrastructure that has been set up to provide advanced computing services for research and innovation. And we federate approximately 300 data uh, and computing national centers uh, spread across 50 countries. And since uh, the establishment in 2010, uh, we have been supporting tens of thousands of researchers for several hundred of virtual organizations in the area of uh, HPC, but we are more on the low end of the HPC. We are not like price uh, with uh, more on the high end. And we also provide cloud services, as, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, EGI is one of the main actors in the implementation of EOSC, uh, which is uh, one of the pillar uh, of the European Cloud uh, Initiative. Uh, published by the European Commission in 2016. And uh, since that, we have tried to integrate uh, resources, data set, and organization into a sustainable ecosystem. And as part of this ecosystem, uh, exascale and quantum computing uh, are the most preci precious research for uh, the most precious resources for, sorry, for research and innovation but they cannot work in, in isolation, and we need to work all together. This is what I try to, uh, to illustrate in that diagram, that to make the most out of the exascale resources, uh, there is a, a need for pre-processing the data, for preparing the data, for staging the data, and so that we, we ensure that everything, and from what our colleagues said, that everything will be ready when you need it. And also, you cannot ask researcher. we have been used to work with uh, a single computer or a couple of, of servers to scale up from tens of processors to millions of, of processors. And there is a learning curve, and we have to, to train and to teach people how to increase and how to scale up. So this is what we are working on, and, and we, we have to work together uh, as an ecosystem. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this part of training and teaching is very important, and we'll come back to that uh, later. Uh, in our discussion. Um, so let's, uh, let's uh, uh, hear the um, viewpoint of uh, a neuroscientist who actually works with uh, rather large data sets. So Professor Hilsov Pov, Paul uh, is a neuro... Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> now um, I got a bit ahead of myself. Um, Professor Hilsov Paul is a neuroscientist at the Brain Center Rudolf Magnus, uh, University Medical Center Utrecht. Uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, she uh, investigates structural and functional brain plasticity uh, throughout life in health and in psychiatric diseases uh, using MR imaging. And uh, as you can see, she is involved in uh, several international and national uh, research consortia. So your perspective okay. on yes. high performance computing. First, I would like to thank uh, you and organizers very much for inviting me to serve on this uh, panel of this very interesting uh, meeting. Um, yes, and I would like to make the point, uh, working in a hospital with uh, large research data on patients and healthy individuals, that HPC computing is really essential for the next phase of personalized uh, health and treatment. And uh, that's all the case for better outcome. I'll be back what that means in a moment. And I guess that through machine learning, deep learning, and even reinforcement uh, methodologies based on longitudinal, and that's the other really key thing, research data, as well as clinical data, we can get there. Um, and my last point, I, I, I wait a bit. Um, so why do we need HPC uh, clustering for? We need that because we want to analyze, starting with 
very large uh, community data, be this uh, in my field of magnetic resonance brain imaging, combined with genetics, as well as in the future, hopefully more and more environmental uh, data through uh, these kinds of facilities. Um, and then we need these very advanced strategies and uh, compute methodologies in order not just to compute uh, that a group difference in health as compared to a disease, such as in psychosis, but for this particular individual. And even more so, you don't want to say you have a, a chance of such and such to become uh, ill. You want to know how this person is doing. And if you get the treatment, what the best treatment for you as an individual is. So the outcome data, in this sense, is crucial. You need follow-up data. With just one measurement, we are uh, collecting loads of data, but you need to follow up. You need to know what the outcome is. And often the outcome is not inside, but outside hospitals, for instance. So we also need a lot of linking of data. Then obviously, but I guess many have referred to that uh, in, in greater detail, we need these very advanced technologies on these HPC clusters to be developed in order to make this uh, processing possible and also to make it possible in a feasible time. You don't want to spend weeks waiting for results. You want this, in fact, almost real time, at least at a very short notice, in order to act on it and in order to move in faster. And also new technologies, you want to move in and have these implemented also in the clinic much faster. We need research data. We use often still research data, which go through um, uh, all these medical ethical procedures, very good, and have very good controlled uh, acquisition protocols, etc. But we also have a wealth of clinical data available and only a very a uh, small percentage of those data are currently being used to advance our knowledge here. And there's really a wealth of knowledge lying there and not currently being used for, uh, for science uh, to advance uh, these kinds of methodologies. Obviously, we need the longitudinal data to be implemented, and that's quite a challenge because you need from within individuals these changes over time. But from my own experience, that's absolutely worthwhile because if you see changes within individuals, you see changes uh, like brain plasticity and how you adapt with the environment, and we all know that's basically uh, what we do. If you want to stay healthy and have the best health uh, there is, you also need this adaptation uh, very crucially. So. I think, uh, and I want to show this one uh, example of a study I'm involved in called uh, Enigma, Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics Through a Meta-Analysis, which is a worldwide consortium, uh, led by Paul Thompson, who is European but American-based, uh, and that gathers imaging data, so brain scan data with uh, genetics, uh, genotyping for GWAS studies, finding in this phase genes for brain, uh, brain structures. And uh, there have been studies published now over 30,000 uh, individuals in those studies. And these people are situated all over the world. These, every person here represents a cohort. And, but over 50% is from Europe, from these scans, uh, from these cohorts. 50% is from Europe. So that's already very dense. But now if we look at, we do, person, uh, we do a study uh, called, as part of Enigma, which is called Enigma Plasticity, looking at the changes over time and the genes that might be implicated in brain plasticity. And for that, we use two MRI scans and the genotyping. And here, look if you see of the cohorts that are currently being involved. It's at least over 75% European. So Europe is so well situated for having these really high quality data that is longitudinal, be it in patients or healthy individuals across the lifespan, that I think we're in an excellent position uh, with HPC and faster uh, and better software to make uh, and really see a better outcome and a better health for all of us in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very exciting. Um, so from these large scale um, data sets uh, that basically describe uh, uh, you know, the influence of genetic variations in huge populations. We now come to um, uh, someone who investigates uh, the brain function as a whole, considering uh, molecular data, functional imaging. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Knudsen. Um, 
So Professor Knudsen is a translational neurobiologist and clinical neurologist with a special interest in multimodal imaging. Uh, she is uh, president-elect of the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology and the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Human Brain Projects. Okay. Your perspective. Would you like to have... Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I will focus on personalized uh, health and medicine. Um, but uh, before doing that, I think I would like to make the distinction between the term personalized medicine, which largely refers to our genome and how that can inform us to address uh, how we can better treat and target the single individuals. So I think if you take one on, that, uh, and again, and then one more maybe. No, just go two back, that's fine. So one, one yeah. So. Uh, leave it like that. So, um, so uh, what we could instead look for as a first uh, goal would be to uh, identify the precision medicine, which is really where we can, um, without using the genome to a very large extent, still come up with uh, some better ways to decide which drug is the best for what person. And um, uh, and I think uh, the high-performance computing uh, may be a necessity when it comes to doing things such as genomic information and looking at all the variations and use that in large data. I think we have some other issues that we need to resolve too, and that's probably something we need to do the sooner the better. And uh, this is, of course, making sure that we can collect all these data uh, not only on a department level, a hospital level, a region level, but actually across uh, countries and across continents. Uh, and this, of course, uh, comes with some challenges. I think uh, some of the challenges we as clinicians are facing these days uh, is the legislation, uh, the informed consent that we sometimes need. I think this is a very uh, huge ethical issue that cannot be resolved overnight, but if we want to arrive at a true precision medicine approach, I think it's something that needs to be taken very seriously and it requires uh, a lot of work. Another uh, problem that we need to deal with is that data come in, as you can see, from various sources, genomic, biochemical, brain imaging, um, but those data come in different shapes and different forms. So the data needs to be curated in order to be put into uh, a, a large analysis. So this is another thing that needs to be done. It's uh, to devise standards for how we report our different issues, be it biochemical or neuroimaging or whatever. And I think uh, one thing that we certainly in Europe will face is that if we want to share data across countries within Europe, there are certain cultural differences, language issues that also needs to be uh, considered. Um, so we've heard about this, do we want to do, do big data um, or do we, do, need, do we want to do hypothesis driven studies? I think that one thing does definitely not exclude the other. Uh, so the big data can give us some hypothesis that we can subsequently test in a more structured form. Uh, another uh, way of making sure that we are not uh, looking at false positives is to make sure that we have these replications done over and over again in different subsets of the cohorts to make sure that we can actually identify that. So the, the last slide I'll show you is just uh, what uh, was also shown by Hilike uh, Paul before, and this is uh, how this can benefit our uh, pharmaceutical industry is actually that um, by defining our stratified medicine and identifying features in patients, we can better target uh, new types of medicine once developed. And this means that some of the huge clinical trials that are undertaken, very, very expensive, uh, and particularly for brain disorders, it has been quite discouraging. I think if we make this approach, chances that we can come up with some uh, better ways of assessing new drugs and define subgroups where the drug works, uh, they are much higher. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So finally, um, a really futuristic um, uh, take on high-performance computing. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor Kostadinov, uh, who is uh, investigating micro and nano robotics at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences uh, with application in micro and nanotechnologies, uh, manufacturing and biology. Uh, you have a, a Horizon 2020 project uh, on micro and nano robotics for single cell cancer uh, for single cancer cells, and uh, you are also an advisor to the um, Minister for Education and Science uh, for Science and Innova uh, sci for Science and Innovation. Thank you very much for being here and uh, give us your uh, statement. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have to hurry a little bit up to be uh, uh, to be honest. Um, Sorry. Okay, so okay. Thank uh, you, I Chair. just uh, see that we have only 25 minutes left, so... Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. We are developing uh, micro and nano robotics uh, mm -hmm. for cell manipulation, for cell operation, for uh, mechanical treatment of cells. Main technological challenges in that field are autom automation, of uh, tracking of moving, moving bio-objects uh, and operation with micro-objects. Uh, these micro-objects here in this case are cells in micro-range. Would you like to show It doesn't matter. So, uh, such uh, cells here are shown, and uh, tracking uh, have been performed by small objects uh, with uh, size of three, three microns. This is a sperm cell. So, uh, and manipulation with uh, one nanometer resolution. This is the opportunities of uh, robotic systems uh, develop. Uh, now we are uh, developing together with our colleagues from the, now is working, uh, the movies are working. Uh, together with our colleagues from Institute of Molecular Biology, uh, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, we are uh, developing uh, application of spicy mint robot uh, for laser micro irradiation to study DNA, DNA repair. The use of this uh, robotic micro injection system uh, will allow the injection of purified CRISPR-9 nucleus together uh, with uh, sgRNA cells into cells. This will make uh, possible to label proteins or to remove genes into single cells on cells lines uh, that don't allow to, uh, for long selection. Here you can see the injection of uh, cancer cells, uh, hard to transfer cells here on the left side. And uh, on the bottom side is tracking of uh, a sperm cell uh, with size of three microns. And here is uh, the measuring of uh, cell mechanical properties. Uh, this is a stiffness of the membrane uh, of uh, zebrafish cell. Uh, thus, the CRISPR single cell uh, modulation coupled with uh, modern cell live cell microscopy, which is shown on the figure, uh, with confocal microscope allows you to study the dynamics of many rapid processes such uh, as maintaining genomic stability and repairing of DNA. Uh, for this, uh, we need uh, HPC resources for tracking of moving bio-objects, visualization, and for uh, image recognition and, of course, uh, storage of uh, big data uh, in real-time robotics application for biological cells. 
which allow us uh, further development of this micro and nano robot methodology in uh, Europe. Our currently funded uh, Horizon 2020 project, as uh, Emrah mentioned, is uh, uh, micro and nano robotics for single cancer cell cells, which uh, also uh, need uh, high HPC uh, resources, not only for robotics itself, but uh, for modeling, for uh, uh, data-driven simulation, for visualization and analysis of uh, these uh, single cancer cells to be analyzed. Especially, this is crucially uh, for the online tele uh, manipulation uh, application uh, uh, useful for our partners from uh, Europe and from China in this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very exciting. So I uh, really would like to use the remaining time to discuss a bit about the uh, availability and uh, the uh, obstacles to implementation of high performance computing. Um, so um, I would like to ask all of you, so uh, in the interest of time, try to keep your uh, responses as brief of, uh, as possible. Um, Professor Hills of uh, Paul, um, you are really dealing with super large data sets, and obviously this is something that um, would be good if would be harnessed even more by more scientists. Um, where do you see the uh, major obstacle for making this type of approach more used by the scientific community? If you mean a central facility? For instance, would that be helpful or, or, or are there other obstacles? Um, yes, I see, I see mostly uh, advantages because I think that uh, also with upscaling of all these procedures with uh, in, in new um, options for uh, DNA uh, analyses and also for a higher uh, level uh, imaging, uh, not completely as was been shown uh, earlier, but in that direction. Uh, but I think there's also some challenges to overcome. And obviously, I think one has been um, discussed by uh, Professor Knudsen, that there's the harmonization of data, so how to link them. There is the harmonization within an individual, so how do we link this to an individual? And if we have all this data of an individual, uh, how do we make sure that this still is protected uh, from, uh, so that the privacy is sufficiently mm -hmm. being taken care of? Yeah. And other than that, I think it's going to help us tremendously. I mean, when, when we uh, now heard this uh, exciting news that there will be one million genomes uh, sequenced, um, it would, of course, be fantastic to bring this also together with brain imaging data at some point. Yep. But I think the key challenge will be that these data are properly analyzed and, and uh, really harvested. Um, so what motivated you and how can you motivate others to do this? <laughs> uh, what motivated me? Uh, curiosity, for, uh, definitely. Just wanting to know um, how brain plasticity works, how, mm -hmm. it, how we are able life, lifelong to adapt to a changing environment, because I think that's quite crucial. And the other is that I work in a psychiatric uh, department for most part uh, with a very technical group and that we're all very dedicated in, in seeing if we can solve psychiatric disorders in particular psychosis in the, in our studies um, and that um, I feel that the way ahead is still diving deeping into the brain uh, uh, and that um, with these faster and more advanced uh, method this is possible to give you an example from the genetics part uh, one from the imaging part obviously when we started several many years ago there was the discussion whether there was something in the brain happening and now it's so clearly everybody uh, has this clear vision where it happens we don't know what it means at this point mm -hmm. that's the challenge and the other is from the genetics point of view there's been many years that it was not able with genome-wide screening to find any genes involved in schizophrenia, and now there's over 128 identified. So it's okay. getting there, thanks to thank these kind of procedures. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Knudsen, uh, you are um, combining multimodal imaging data to understand brain function. You're also advisor to the Human Brain Project. Uh, as a neuroscientist myself, I know that it is much more comfortable for scientists to take a more redu reductionist approach and focus on just one brain region. So how, how, how would you motivate uh, the science community to actually take a more global 
uh, approach uh, be a bit more visionary and risky and also actually make use of uh, you know these uh, wonderful capabilities that the human brain project is building up well i think that um that what you often face as a new scientist is that you uh, need to take into account that you do multiple comparisons. So some statistical methods that can actually allow us to make some sound conclusions is probably what we need. And, and I think that um, we see often, we've often seen scientific data come out that somehow were inflated. Uh, and, and I think in order to, I think we just have to realize that we need to develop better tools and that we have to get used to the fact that things must be replicated uh, in order for us to start to implement it. Because that's what we're discussing right now is also how can we move to that phase where we actually can make it helpful for not groups, but for the single individual. And I think that takes, um, that will take uh, a lot of effort and we'll have to get used to think about it differently. Um, and, and to the question for high performance computing, I think it's wonderful for the things that are going on in the human brain project. Um, but that's a different story than the precision medicine approach that the clinicians are asking for. At some stage, I'm hopeful that these things will meet and that we can make use of the information and from the single individual. Thank you very much. Um, I think the uh, replicability issue and, uh, could be a very good use case also for high performance computing. Um, Professor Boyas, uh, you made a very nice introduction that um, you know, we are now at a stage where we're really integrating data about the entire organism in order also to just understand brain function, just in quotation mark. So we need information about the blood, about inflammation, the microbiome, the heart, skeletal muscles, and so on. Um, where do you see basically the major obstacles uh, in Europe in order to move uh, further along these types of, uh, you know, integrated uh, discoveries? I, I don't think the obstacles are in Europe, I think, uh, on the contrary, uh, Europe could play a pioneering role in this domain. So what you are mentioning is this list of factors you, you are listing, uh, which are, let's say, some of them probably indirectly causal factors, those on one, associated with factors, etc., etc. So it belongs for the uh, theme which uh, is the main topic today. It belongs to big data analysis. Okay, and certainly we have to think uh, about the way the data are analyzed, are analyzed, uh, which means what has to be put into the algorithm, mainly, that's a question, what has to be put into the algorithm, and uh, it's certainly, uh, not only the biological or clinical plausibility has to be added to the algorithm, but also we have to probably to modify the general memory model for it, which is certainly uh, as far as computing is concerned, a big, big challenge. But I see that in, in, in this way. Otherwise, hierarchically, we will have great, great difficulties to extract what is at the origin or not, or concerned or not by uh, 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 the modifications in encounter in the disease. So that, I think, the way it is analyzed, for me, it's crucial. It's not the factors themselves, not the identification of the risk, which is clearly established from a clinical perspective. As well, we are just mentioning uh, the heritability of <coughs> uh, 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 psychiatric disorders. It's the highest heritability in medicine, 70 to 80 percent for schizophrenia or bipolar disorders. And what is the outcome of the GWAS study? Almost nothing. So I'm sorry, it's probably too radical, but there's no uh, 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 common gene uh, implicated. There's, uh, in terms of uh, the main genetic variation, nothing uh, can explain more as a two digits percent of the irritability. That, that's a problem. Certainly, the way it is analyzed is, is at the center of the problem. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Professor Rossetti, uh, you gave a, a very nice uh, introduction to your work and the role of high performance computing in drug discovery. Um, so, what do you think is necessary to make Europe really uh, one of the leading places for this, or the, the leading place? Well, uh, of course, uh, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, drug design uses uh, 
several uh, uh, different uh, uh, tools like genomics, proteomics, uh, uh, system biology and uh, network analysis. Uh, all these methodologies rely, of course, uh, on uh, as a skill computing. So, I mean, uh, for sure, the, gen the to enhance, uh, to go towards as a skill computing is a, or could be a good. Uh, 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 would push in this direction. But uh, in drug design, uh, there are also other obstacles, like for instance, uh, we really need miss uh, uh, software development. R right now we have, uh, for each stage of the drug design uh, process, we have uh, uh, very efficient uh, uh, codes that are developed for, the, for the pre that uh, given field and for a given uh, supercomputing architecture. And uh, this is different uh, uh, among the different uh, among uh, the, the diverse disciplines. So we do not have any automatized protocol that is able to integrate uh, algorithms uh, optimized for different uh, uh, supercomputing architecture. And in this respect, for sure, the concept of uh, modular computing that has been developed uh, in Ulish is a big advantage in this direction. And finally, uh, I believe that uh, there is a problem of. Um, cultural barrier, because uh, when you deal with multidisciplinary field, uh, it's very uh, uh, difficult to break down the cultural barrier among the, in the for, especially in the education, it's very difficult to bring a medical student to understand that uh, he can use actually a physics-based approach to, to help uh, himself in diagnosis and therapeutics and vice versa, math and, and the physics student to understand that they can have a real impact in, uh, in health. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so. We are making very good progress, but we have only two minutes left. <laughs> so, um, one question I would really ask, uh, like to ask uh, Professor Allegra is, you know, how can we improve uh, access of scientists and clinicians uh, to high-performance computing? Uh, in my impression, this is really one of the major barriers. We talked about this many times today. Uh, how can people understand you know, how to approach it and how to use it? What can you, what, what needs to be done? Yeah, so we heard this morning that uh, there is also an initiative that will uh, accompany the, the development of uh, high-performance computing and exascale computing, and they are the center of excellence that are there also to train uh, scientists and, and users on how to use uh, high-performance computing and to help them to develop or code the tune, uh, tune the code, sorry. Uh, but I, I think that the main issue is not really the technology, because the technology is something that we know how to master. We can always overcome most of the issue in a rather short period of time. The main barrier from my point of view is to change mindset of people. So uh, for them to, to be able to collaborate, to share their data, to work together, just to, to build up the, the case that will require the use of such high performance computer uh, and exascale machine. And also I think one of the barrier uh, might be uh, the, the legal, the, the difference in the legal system uh, throughout Europe. Uh, as we have heard, we have 27 different, uh, at least, uh, system to, to handle medical data. And we haven't yet uh, analyzed what will be the impact of GDPR, for example, or if there will be, and how we will handle it. So we have to learn about that uh, in addition to, to training people and helping them changing their mindset. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so it's uh, half past three, uh, but uh, maybe one final question to Professor Kostadinov. Or half past four, sorry. Um, how, how do you think, can you basically make your methodology more widely uh, available uh, in Europe? I mean, it sounds like a really fascinating approach. Yeah. Uh, the robotic uh, methodology is almost ready. So it depends from the biology, uh, uh, colleagues from the medicine, from other uh, field that uh, apply for biomedical application, especially for personalized medicine. Now we are uh, can apply for the in vitro fertilization technique, uh, uh, choosing the uh, the most appropriate sperm cell and. Uh, uh, and to inject into the human egg cell. So this is uh, what we can do uh, right now. Other things is uh, to inject into the cells uh, drugs and to investigate the resistance or the influence of the drugs into the individual cells. And this could be done, for example, thousands of cells per hour. So manually now it's 40, 40 cells for uh, hour. 
So this is, uh, is uh, let's say, available. It depends from our colleagues from other disciplines. Thank you very much. So I think you know we covered an interesting range uh, um, of uh, really relevant topics in personalized health and uh, medicine. One very important topic, namely access to health records by insurance companies, something we wanted to talk about. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we will not be able to. Um, but still, um, I hope this was uh, interesting for all of you. It just shows us that uh, you know large-scale flagship projects such as the Human Brain Project have a really important role to play, not only to make uh, uh, high-performance computing accessible, but also understandable. And, uh, and I think that's the major, major um, you know, hurdle um, in order to really um, make the most of this method. I would like to, pen to thank the panel members for their succinct and interesting contributions and uh, to you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, can you still hear me? So there is now a 15-minute coffee break. <laughs>